Good morning. Um, this is a, going to be a distance learning webinar showing some best practices for using Personal Finance Lab in Personal Finance classes, um, some best practices and some help for teachers getting started. First up, who am I? Uh, my name is Kevin Smith. I am the Director of Product Development at PersonalFinanceLab.com. If you've attended some of our webinars before, you've probably heard my voice, but this might be the first time seeing my face. Um, this is because I am now even following some of the best practices for remote learning, so, um, which one of the keys is making sure that your audience can see you once in a while. Um, I have my master's degree in economics from the Concordia University in Montreal. I specialize in game theory and how uh, students in particular make decisions. I have a background in economics. Um, I'm working on a second master's in public administration. I've been developing curriculum for high school personal finance, economics, and business classes for about six years. I frequently guest lecture at universities across the United States and the United Kingdom, and I am a frequent uh, presenter at national conferences, uh, Jam Jumpstart, National Business Educators Association, um, and dozens of others. So you might have seen me before. If not, um, hello for the first time. Uh, but I have a lot of experience with distance learning. I personally do work from home, so I have a lot of experience in communicating with teams. So this presentation is basically walking teachers who might have never tried remote learning before understand how to use our resources and get the most out of their classes. So what we are going to do is go over some of the key concepts of what I'm going to cover here. Um, I'm going to be talking about using personalfinancelab.com's resources as a foundation. Um, the way we work is we use our games, our budgeting game and stock games as kind of a foundational activity. These are long-term activities that will keep your students engaged over a wide period of time, between usually between six and eight weeks, but it can go longer depending on how you structure the class. Um, and it's 100% online. So the idea is that you can use these foundational activities as kind of the core for your remote distance learning classes. Uh, once we have those games set up, we're going to start layering on lessons and curriculum um, in chunk-sized pieces, so we keep students engaged over a long period of time. We're going to use a lot of mixed media. We're going to use some built-in assessments. Uh, the entire idea here is that the games keep the students engaged while we kind of add in the learning on the side with it. That way the students aren't sitting and reading a specific you know, textbook for too long. They're not sitting through long lectures. But what they're doing is they're getting a constant update of little bits and pieces that add up to a full curriculum and a full course. So everything I'm going to talk about is customizable. So if you have lesson plans, you have other resources you want to use, they fit right in. I'll explain how you can do that. Um, but we're going to start with the Personal Finance Lab resources specifically, and I'm going to talk about how you can add other stuff in um, later on. So first up is setting up the games. So to do this, you will need a teacher account on the personalfinancelab.com website. Uh, if you don't have one, uh, I will show you how to get one at the end of this presentation but I'm going to switch over to my Personal Finance Lab account so I can get you started. So here I am at the personalfinancelab.com website. I've logged into my teacher account. Let me zoom in a little bit so it's a bit easier to see. And I'm going to create a challenge or a class. Now, like I just said, the idea here is the first thing we're going to do is set up those two games, the stock game and the budgeting game. Um, the idea behind both is they're both long-term activities so you're going to be able to have the students are going to be able to come in each day or each couple of days and be doing something new and different each time. Um, but at the same time, they directly interface with all the rest of the lessons and they all kind of tie together. That way, the students can always be pulling things together and seeing how things different connect in different ways. I'm going to call it uh, Mr. Smith's Spring 2020 Personal Finance, which is just a name. It'll appear when your students go to register. Like I've done this before. Um, and a description, again, when your students first sign in, this just makes sure they know they're in the right place. Um, number of students is used by our analytics team when we're allocating how many resources we get, so that just helps. The registration dates is when your students can come in and create their accounts for the first time. Um, you can usually assume that some students are going to have some problems, not always, but you know. I, we've all worked with technology before and we've seen how it can work with students trying to understand it. So have a registration window that's big enough for your students to actually get into your class. Uh, the time zone, since we are going to be dealing with a stock in particular, there is some time dependent stuff going on. So just pick your time zone to make sure everything matches up with what your students are expecting. This last setting is for a forum. 
So we imagine the vast majority of teachers who are using us for distance learning already have some kind of learning management system in place. Um, that's going to make your life a lot easier. But we also have a forum feature built into the Personal Finance Lab site. So um, if you already have an LMS, you'll probably want to turn this off and have the teachers or have your students use the one that you already have built for your school. But if you don't have it or you don't like it, um, you can also turn on our forums here. This will let the students post messages directly in the platform. They can see each other's messages and reply to them. Um, since the students aren't going to be in class with each other, this is a pretty good way to keep, have them keep in touch. Uh, but again, the R form is pretty basic, so if you have a learning management system already, you'll probably just want to use that. Uh, next, we're going to choose the rules for our class stock game. So the class stock game is a real-time stock market game. It's the most advanced one for high schools on the market, and it has a ton of settings you can mess around with. Um, the idea behind the stock game is that it lets the students react to real information in real time. So you're letting the real world do some of the teaching for you, because when students start building the portfolio, especially when they're doing it in a remote learning environment, they're going to be checking their portfolio relatively frequently. Um, usually more once or twice a day, um, more often for some of the more engaged students, which means that they're going to be reacting to what's going on in the real world. They're going to build a portfolio of real stocks and bonds and mutual funds. They're going to see the prices moving in real time. Um, everything is streaming on our platform. And they're going to be able to see the news stories that are driving the, the events going behind each of their um, portfolio movements. So um, I'll show you what it looks like a little bit more in a minute, but the idea here is you're going to choose some basic settings for your class. Um, the trading window, so when you're doing a remote learning class, you're going to want the trading window to go pretty late into the class. Um, one of the most common projects is that at the end of the trading window, the students will have to build a kind of summative report of what happened in their portfolio and then present it to the class. That also works really well in a, in a um, distance learning environment. So you'll want the trading end date to be somewhere near the end of your class, maybe not quite the end. Um, after the trading end date, we freeze all the students' portfolios. So if they keep logging in, they'll see exactly everything as it was on the last day that they were trading. Uh, for all the rest of the settings, you'll be safe if you just go with the defaults. That's what most teachers use. That's why we made them defaults. But you can play around with them if you like. Um, change the amount of cash students start with, give them different interest rates. Um, some of the more interesting ones that you can use are down here at the bottom. So. For example, the public portfolios, this would let your students see each other's trades. Um, in a competitive environment, this isn't always a great thing because it lets the students uh, basically copy whoever's in first, but um, this can be very useful at the very beginning of the class. So you can change all these rules later. So one common way to do this is for the first week or so, you'll let all the portfolios be public so the students can see each other building their portfolios or seeing how they do it. And then you'll turn this off so that for the rest of the competition, the students are kind of on their own. Um, this second one, do you include yourself in the rankings? Yes or no? Um, that's to your personal preference, but we will say that teachers or uh, classrooms that have the teacher participating in the stock game, where you'll place a trade every week or so, do get a lot better engagement because the students like to try to beat the teacher. Um, one of the other settings that isn't in here um, as a specific rule is that you can also have your students work in groups. So. Every student will have their own portfolio of $100,000 or whatever you want to give them, but I'll show you later, you can also group your students into teams, and putting them teams will let them uh, basically jointly manage the portfolio. So every student still has their own cash, but then we take everybody in the team and we add them all together into a big group portfolio too with group rankings. Um, especially in a distance learning environment, that's a very powerful tool to add another good long-term group project where the students can still have some individual movement and you can see what each individual student has been contributing. But then, um, especially when we're talking about that end of class presentation or report, having them work together as a team that has some very clear advantages. Um, next up is just what your students can trade. Um, how many trades can they make? Um, how many trades can they make per day? Um, so. This usually isn't a problem, but we do see some students get really far into it, and you can really start to limit day trading, um, saying students can only place like five trades in a single day, something like that. Um, and this last one, require trade notes, is a very important one. This means that every time a student goes to place a trade in their portfolio, they need to write a couple sentences about why they're doing it. Um, you can see these as the teacher. The student can review these later. 
and this is a really important part of driving the learning process. So I'm turning that on for now. Um, next up, what can the students trade? You know, most classes stick with stocks, mutual funds, and bonds. There's other options if you want to get really advanced, but that's up to you. And the international exchanges students can trade on. So there's a bunch of different exchanges available. Um, pick whichever ones you like. Sticking to the U.S. is going to be easier for most students. Um, you can also customize your exchanges, which would mean basically you don't want your students trading Apple stock, for example. Uh, this comes up with a lot of schools that say they don't want their students trading marijuana stocks or something. So you can put some stock symbols in here that you want to block the students from trading. Um, you can do a lot of other stuff, but that's not really relevant to what most classes are going to be doing. So I'm going to turn this off and ignore it. Um, and that's all you need for the stock game. You're done. So I took a long time with that, but really, if you want to set this up, two minutes, you just put your name in it and you use all the default settings, you're going to be good to go. Um, next up is our budgeting game. So our budgeting game puts your students in the role of a college student with a part-time job. Um, let me actually switch over to a class I already set up so you can see a little bit what this looks like. So here we go. Um, now, I um, this is from a student's perspective. I'm joining into the, the budgeting game. Basically, I have, I'm have i a college student. I have a part-time job. I need to move through the game. Uh, I will get my paycheck once a week. I have bills that come up. Um, I don't know how much money I'm going to make um, too far ahead of time because I get different hours in my part-time job. But I also don't know what kinds of expenses I'm going to get. So. The stock game is an activity where students are going to be spending probably about 10 to 15 minutes on it per day, uh, maybe more if they're doing more research or you give them other exercises to do. The budget game, each month in the game takes students about 20 minutes to complete. Uh, most games go for 12 virtual months, so 12 times 20 is uh, 240 minutes. You can have more or less months depending on how much class time you want to dedicate to this. Um, to go through the game, the students click the dice button, which rolls them forward through each month. Um, like I said, each month takes about 20 minutes to complete. And as they go through, they have bills that come up. So this is my phone bill. It looks like I already paid it for this month, so I'll ignore it. Um, and then I have an unexpected, I have an expense come up. So I've also got another bill. This is my grocery tip, trip. Um, so I'm paying $125 a month in groceries. And for each expense, I can use my debit card or credit card. Uh, one of the objectives of the game is to have students build up their credit score. And they can only do that by using their credit card and paying it off on time. One of the other objectives is for them to build up their savings balance. So transferring money into their savings account to build up their emergency fund. They get a bunch of game score points for that. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of um, features that work together. But basically, it's set up to have students um, Re get reinforced for best practice of personal finance. Uh, we make it realistic as, as we can. So this is my paycheck I just received. I see my wage, it, you know, it's like a real pay stub where it shows all my withholdings. Um, I deposit to my checking account, it appears right away. Um, and then at the end of each dice roll, I get an event. So this time something good happened. I actually earned some money, which I kind of needed. So great, deposit that. Um, but other times a lot of bad stuff will happen. Um, flat tires on my car, um, I need to buy a new textbook for my college classes, that kind of thing. So there's over 400 different events that students can get any given time. Um, as they go through the game, they, their real goals are to build up their credit score, build their quality of life, which they can do by spending money and picking more expensive uh, options for things, and building up their savings balance, especially their, their first thousand dollar emergency fund. So um, you can, at the end of this presentation, I'll give you a link where you can get a uh, basically a trial account for the budgeting game to see a little bit more how it works, but it's pretty straightforward. And then as the teacher, my next setting here when I'm working on my class is actually setting my class budgeting game. You have a lot of control over what goes on here. So just like the stock game, I'm going to choose some dates, you know, the start date and stop date. Usually you'll want the stop date to be, you know, a week before your class ends. But I also can choose how many months of the game the students complete. 
So um, in a basic in-person class where students can work on this maybe you know half an hour a week, 12 months is good because that will take up most of the class. In a remote class, you might want to go longer um, because students have a little bit more time they can play around with it. And the more months they can do in the game, the more opportunities they have to make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and improve. So I'm going to set this to 24 for now. Um, next up, you choose how your students start the game. So what's their starting checking balance, starting saving balance? I'm going to give my students $0 to start in their savings account. I'll give them $500 in their checking account. Um, that'll make the game pretty challenging to begin with, but that's OK. Um, it's, every week, they'll start earning paychecks where they start, um, they'll be able to build up that balance pretty quickly. Um, then the teachers can set what kinds of bills the students receive. So monthly rent, how much are your students paying rent, how much is their phone bill, how is their internet bill, that kind of thing. Now your students will have some decisions to make on this. So for example, when they start the game, they'll choose where exactly they want to rent, but all of the options they're given are going to be around this average that you set. So if I have $250 a month, one student might have you know, $200 rent, another student might have a $300 rent, um, most students will be somewhere in between. Uh, you can also choose how much the students earn at their part-time job. So $18 an hour is kind of the standard um, just to make it so the students are earning a living wage with a part-time job. But <clears throat> you can set this higher or lower as you see fit. And then down here you can change the kinds of events that pop up for your students. So the default ones is the majority of the events. This is the standard stuff just to make sure the game works. But you can also say I want to emphasize risk and insurance this week. Or I want to emphasize charity and taxes this week. Um, all that you can you know mix and match these as your game goes on. At the bottom here, we just give you a summary of what the game actually looks like for your students. So based on all the settings you put up here, your students are going to earn about this much. They're going to have about this much in expenses, um, and then they're going to have this much that they'd be able to realistically save. You don't want this to be too high. You really want your students to be only be able to save about 10 to 15 percent of their paycheck. If you have them able to save a lot more than that, then it removes some of the learning aspects. It makes it so the game becomes a little too easy. They can hit all of their savings goals without making any sacrifices, um, and the decisions become a little bit meaningless. You want them to be a little bit tight each month. Um, conversely, you don't want this to be too far negative either, because if it's too far negative, the students are never going to be able to catch up. They're going to start falling into credit card debt, and there's not much they can do about it. Um, just like the stock game, you can come in and change all of these settings as the game goes on, and we encourage you to do so. So give your students a pay raise or a pay cut. Um, change around how much gas costs regularly. Um, things to keep the game a little bit fresh for them. So after that, I have all of my games set up. Um, I don't need to do anything else. The, this last step here is adding in the curriculum, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but I'm going to skip that for now, and I'm all set. So. There's two ways to get your students registered. The first way is this link right here. If you give your students this link, it'll ask them to create their own username and password, which they can use to log in. That's by far the most common way teachers get their students into their class, because it gives them a little bit more individuality. The other way is using our what we call the registration file. With the registration file, you will just say, I have 10 students. I need 10 logins. Um, please give them to me. So. Let's say my high school mascot was Knights. So I'll put Knights here. I need 10 logins, and I'll add them. And the system generates 10 usernames and passwords for me, which I can distribute to my students. So you can reset these passwords anytime. You can change your students' usernames at any time. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. Uh, but this is another straightforward way if you want to just get your students in with no hassle whatsoever. Now, this is a quote I got just this morning from a teacher who's been using this for a few years. Um, it was unsolicited, but I liked getting it because it helps show that what we do here works. Um, the best platform out there that I've used, I love the assignments, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, they like being able to change things around to match the real world. Um, they love the trading notes, and they already made new contests for the new ones um, for, as they just said, during this current uh, virtual crisis. And they, and as I like to see, I got a recommendation. So, you know, this whole process where I just went through everything and setting up, it seems like it was a lot of work, but it really only takes about five minutes. And if you need any help, there was live chat buttons on every page, and our support team will walk you through it, or we can just set it up for you so it's ready for your class. Um, 
And once it's set up, you have all kinds of reports and you have all kinds of stuff to make it easy for you going forward. Our, our point here is to make it as easy for you to start launching your remote learning classes as, as fast as possible. So, um, like I said, if you're not sure about the settings, stick with the defaults. So, for the budget game, if you stick with the defaults, you're going to get a balanced game. It's going to work. It's all you really need. Um, you can play around with the settings if you really want the rent and some of the other expenses to match your local area, in which case you might want to play around with the wages and stuff too, just to make it so you get that healthy. The students can actually save a little bit of money each month. Um, stock game, again, you won't go wrong if you just choose the default settings. So don't worry about it too much, and you can always play around with them later. So next up, we are going to get into the actual learning aspect. So we have a couple games set up now. Um, the students will be able to play those games, which is going to be a big driver for the engagement, especially the, the budgeting game will be a more intensive exercise. We're going to be able to spend 20, 30 minutes on it each day. The stock game is going to be a little bit more um, long term, where they're going to spend at least 15 minutes each day just going over their portfolio and figuring out why their prices went up and down. In both cases, the class rankings will help keep the students really engaged with it in the long term, but we need to start adding in the real meat of the learning exercises. So to do that, um, I'm actually going to refer back to our lesson plan archive. So I'm back on the Personal Finance Lab website, and I'm going to go up to Administration, and I'm going to go to um, Admin Resources. Um, in here, I'm looking for my lesson plan archive. So the lesson plans on how the market works are designed as customizable lesson plans where we have a number of activities that you can mix and match for your class. All of them use the Personal Finance Lab resources in some way. So I'm going to pull up uh, this first one, Introduction to Investing, just to give you an idea of what, what we're looking at here. So we have um, you know, the uh, core objectives, the vocabulary we want to cover, um, the standards, we use the jumpstart standards, the personal finance stuff at the higher level. And then on the side here, you see what exactly we're working with. So we have a bunch of different lessons. Um, each lesson has a time to completion. So you can pick out lessons that you want for your class based on what your teaching objectives are. And you can pick out, you know, the ones that you have time to teach. So with a remote learning class, you'll probably have a little bit more time where students can work individually on these things. So you'll probably want to be grabbing more than less. Um, and we have a key here of what each one has. So direct instruction means that we actually include a Google Slides or a PowerPoint presentation that you can use in class with no extra work needed. Um, other ones include stuff that is in class or homework. So you'll want the stuff that has a little house icon because that works best for remote learning. Um, some of the other stuff, the check marks means we have an assessment built into it. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here designed um, specifically for remote learning, and the idea here is for each lesson plan we have, each you know core topic, investing or credit or whatever, you'll grab the lessons that are going to work for your class, and we give you everything you you need for it. So, for example, under independent activities here. Uh, building an investment strategy lesson. So this is kind of a, a really core thing of what it means to do investing. Here's some stuff for discussion. So we're talking about the forum or the learning management system again back there. With this lesson, if you include it in your class, you're going to want to give your students these discussion prompts. Um, a little bit of stuff to help them in keep engaged and not just kind of go through it. Resource links, so lesson content. This is the lesson on Personal Finance Lab that discusses this topic. So I'm going to pull it up here. Um, and this is building an investing strategy. So it talks about different investment vehicles at a very high level. Um, has a couple tips on how they can build up their portfolio. And every one of our lessons ends with a pop quiz. All of the pop quizzes are between three to five questions. And I'll show you later, but you can choose whether students can retry these for a higher score or they can only take it one time to get, them to, uh, get the points. You can also see for most of these we have an accompanying presentation. This is a Google Slides presentation uh, that you can basically save and copy. If you go back into our Personal Finance Lab website under the admin resources, you can also find all of our presentations um, just in here as well. You can download them as PowerPoints, you can copy them as Google Slides or however you want to use them. So to do this the right way, or do this the easiest way, I should say. There's not necessarily a right way. 
You'll go through the lesson plan library, you'll find a lesson that you want to use. Um, you can click older, there's about um, 25 lesson plans in here right now, but there's more coming as well. You'll look at the activities that you want, and what you're going to want to do is create what's called an assignment. So let's say I do want to use, I want to use everything. I want to use all of these investing lessons to help my students learn about investing because I have plenty of time because my students are at home. To do that, you're going to go to administration and you're going to do what's called assignments. This is where the real learning happens. So it's going to load up the assignments page for my class. I'm going to click create new assignment. And for every assignment, I'm going to give it a name. So for this one, I'm going to call it week one. I'm going to give it a start date, which is today, and a due date, which is going to be one week from today at 11.55 PM. And then I'm going to grab the stuff that I want my students to do. So there's over 300 different lessons in here. Um, all of them are about between 1,000 and 2,000 words. They're written at about an eighth grade reading level, um, some a little bit lower, some a little bit higher, depending on the subject matter. So most of your students are going to have no problem with them. Um, there's articles, there's videos, there's lesson plans, there are um, interactive activities, there's all kinds of stuff. So you just go through this list, you'll pick out the stuff that you think matches what you want your class to do this week, you'll tick off the box to say require it, um, and then this other column over here is a lot of retries. This is whether or not the student can retry the quiz at the end of that article or, or lesson or whatever it is. Once you grab all the stuff that you want for this week, you'll click create and that's all you really need to do. Um, and then you can actually queue these up for later. So I'm going to call this my next I'll do a week two assignment. And this one I'm going to say it starts next week, and it goes for a week. Um, for this one, see, we highlight the ones you've already used so you don't reuse them, but you can go into the personal finance stuff. Um, and now I'm going to grab stuff about spending and budgeting. So budgeting, a little bit stuff about debit cards, um, and using some credit, some you know real basics. Um, and again, you'll, you'll grab as many activities as you want. Each one takes about 15 minutes, so depending on how much time you want to dedicate your class to it, sounds good. Um, if you already have other lesson plans you're using, these work really well as supplements because they are fairly short, kind of easy bite-sized chunks for students to process. And again, you'll just create another assignment you'll add it on. So in total, there's over 300 activities. Um, at the top here, we have some of our basic investing stuff. This is stuff the students need to know in order to use the stock game. Um, they're not going to be able to be successful unless they know these core concepts, so we usually recommend doing those first. Same thing with the intermediate stuff. This is more stuff about the investing in the stock game for the stock game. Um, but then we get into the personal finance stuff, which is real, the, the standards aligned lessons for the teaching objectives you have for your class. So you'll grab the topics that line up with what you want to talk about. Um, you'll grab the lesson plans in the lesson plan library, you'll grab the pre-built presentations. A lot of these have presentations that accompany them that you can use for direct instruction, all fairly short so you're not having your students sit through an hour long lecture. Um, farther down we have our economics lessons. You know, There's a bunch more stuff on economics. A lot of schools combine their personal finance and economics classes so you'll probably be borrowing some of the stuff from in here as well. Um, we also have some career prep. If you have a career prep unit, we have a ton of business uh, stuff, accounting, management, marketing. Um, the last one here is called Investing 101. This one actually is a little bit different in that instead of it being a short article with an assessment at the end, we organize things into chapters with between um, 8 and 12 topics in each chapter, and this is really all about investing. So since you are looking at doing a remote class, we highly recommend you turn on the Investing 101 um, modules. This is a really good supplement for students to work on in the off hours and it'll help them be more successful in the stock game. And if you really get the class competition building up in the stock game, you're going to get a lot of uh, good feedback from this from your students. Beyond that, you can just require your students to do certain actions in the stock game. Play, uh, place a certain number of trades in the budgeting game, tell them to place a certain number of months each assignment, um, that kind of thing. So mix and match all these as you see fit, create new assignments each time, and then that's all you really need. From there you can kick back and let this, the learning happen. So 
I am a student, I'm logging in for the first time, and this is exactly what I see. I come to my stock game page, I have nothing in my portfolio, but I have a lot of stuff I need to get done. Um, on the right side of the page here, I have my assignment my teacher set up with the stuff that's expected of me and how long I have to complete it. Up here, I can switch over to my budgeting game and get started in the budgeting game. So we have a how to play built right in with tutorials showing them how this works. Um, when they start playing the game for the first time, they're asked some of those questions we talked about. Um, where are they going to live? Um, what kind of TV internet plan do they want? And all that kind of stuff. And these Im impact a lot of events that happen throughout the game. It impacts their quality of life and a lot of other things. But that's all you really need to do. Um, and like I said, I kind of went through this exhaustively, but it really doesn't take very long at all for you to get these set up for your class. So like I said, first step, pick a lesson plan, because that's going to give you some guidance about which of the actual um, lessons you're going to want to use. And then just mix and match. Grab the stuff from your lesson plan. If you have other time you can dedicate for it in class, and if you're going remote, you probably do, grab more lessons that look relevant. Most of them are pretty bite-sized, and the idea is that you continually hammer home those core concepts you really need covered for class. Um, to do it, you just pick the dates, you choose the tasks, and you choose whether or not the students can retry it. Straightforward, super easy. Um, and the Investing 101 course, again, it's a complete 10 chapter course. It's really good for remote learning as a supplement, especially for students who might just be naturally inclined to learn a little bit more about investing. Um, but otherwise, it's you know organized in a logical fashion where there's very little for the teacher that, has, that you have to do to make it work. So a little bit more tips just to help you be successful in your class. Um, like I'm doing here, give your students a little bit of face time once in a while. Um, you don't need to have a long, drawn-out lecture every week. You don't need to have um, a ton of video content generated for your students. It is very time-consuming. Using these games and resources is going to save you a lot of effort. Um, but at the same time, you do want to make sure your students stay engaged with the rest of the class. Use the team functionality. Um, after you create your class and your students have registered in the teacher reports, you just have a drag and drop interface where you can put your students into teams. It works really well and it keeps that engagement up. Um, use the class discussion prompts. So in your learning management system, post those questions regularly that come with the lesson plans. Um, write your own if you can. If you don't have a learning management system or you don't like it, just use the forms feature built right into the site and that's a really good uh, formative assessment for the students to make sure that they're kind of on the ball. Uh, use the assignments. We do recommend that you let the students uh, retry most of them. Uh, that gives the students more opportunities to learn. They can make mistakes and correct themselves. So that's a, a really important one to help drive the learning home. Um, last up, hopefully your students are going to enjoy it. So after, the, after you close the trading, you end the budgeting game for your class and your students start building their final reports or presentations, whichever way you want to do it, um, open them back up again. Our support team can help you with that, and that will let the students continue participating in these over the summer um, or you know, longer in, into the class period, depending on when you decide to end it to begin with. The best objective you can possibly get is if your students want to keep learning. For all of those um, lessons and learning objectives that are throughout the site, even if you don't include it in an assignment, the students can find them in our learning center. Uh, we're in the process of adding in badges and other uh, rewards for students to do a little bit more exploration. Um, understanding a little bit more, going a little bit farther than what's required of them. But the whole idea is that these games and simulations work really well to keep the students engaged for long term. Last up, if you don't have a personal finance lab site license already, you can get it. Um, we normally charge $15 per student, but because of the current crisis, we've cut the price by 60%, so it's 5 bucks per student from now through till June 30th. Um, we ha have some free resources available as well, not that many, but like the lesson plans you can get for free. Um, we do have an ad version, ad supported version of the stock game available if necessary. Um, and we're doing a national competition for the budgeting game for a little bit higher level of student engagement for the month of April. So to get that, you'd go to uh, thepersonalfinancelab.com and there's a link to order it for your class. It's very easy to do. And if you have any questions, I do hold remote office hours. So you can contact me, Kevin, at personalfinancelab.com with any questions you have, any tips, any recommendations you have for better ways that this can be done for your classes. 
Um, and you can join me for live chat. I have office hours that I run um, on a weekly basis, so you can drop in there anytime you want uh, for a phone call or a um, live chat um, to get a hold of me and ask any questions you have. So thanks for joining me. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing your classes come in soon. I understand this is a very difficult time to be working with, but we are here to help.